Oi, oi. Hello there, gorgeous. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is episode number uno cuatro siete. In English, that's one four seven. Hola, hombres. Hola, todo el mundo. What's happening? How you doing? How you feeling? Hope you're fine. Hope you're well hydrated, well rested, well lubricated. Your mobility is where it should be. And we're back, man. We're fucking back, right? We're fucking back, man. How are you doing? Good, good to know. Um, and myself, well, I'm fine, man. I'm bloody, bloody fine. I woke up um this morning feeling very fresh, um, very well rested. L- last night, um, you know, um, after work kind of times, I went for a long little three mile and one point uh, three three point one four yeah three point one mile run, kind of you know, just underneath a five k around the block and i felt really good really strong and i've mentioned i think a couple of times here haven't i that um running at night is one of my favorite things to do but i kind of how to say running that's one of my favorite things to do but it's really hard to run at night when you live in an area like i do in stratford where most of the fucking streets aren't really well lit up right there's hardly any lampposts around it's all kind of sketchy looking um and also i have the tendency for my mind to wonder when i'm running because when i'm running i feel quite it's quite a meditative process for me even when i'm running with music i sometimes i'm thinking about other things i want to do whether it's new podcast ideas whether it's new things about my mixes whether it's something i want to write something i want to read like i'm always thinking about shit right and thinking running and listening to music aren't really good combinations especially when you're running in the dark so um these last couple of weeks i've fucked up my toes like royally running across like running around the area um just because i haven't been paying attention one time i stubbed my foot on a curb fell over front um fell over like towards like you know hurtling towards the pavement about to hit my face on the floor and luckily last minute.com kind of splayed my hands out but ended up like cutting up all my palms um another time i fell over in front of these two school girls that they were going to school and the look of horror on their faces as i came tumbling towards them right all of my fucking 15 16 stone of weight like tumbling to all these tiny little girls in probably year eight thinking you know they're gonna die they're gonna get splattered by this huge big man and last minute they'll come i managed to kind of roll and kind of pivot out of the way and then slam my back into a fucking bus stop so it's been a bit it's been a bit helter skelter it's been a bit crazy but um I mean, you know, I'm in good peace. I'm in kind of good condition overall. Um, my endurance has gone up, actually. I need to quickly change this on my display. But my endurance has gone up, which has been quite good. I've been happy about that. My endurance has gone way, way, way up. I don't feel uh, I don't feel as weak as I did pro- previously. In the previous times that I've kind of been running around, I felt quite strong. I feel like I'm in a good kind of, you know, mental space overall when I'm running. Um, even when I get tired, I feel like I can go an extra mile or a mile and a half. Which again is something that you would hear a lot of people say when they start running the first four times. Um, it's really hard to get just that one mile down, right? That one mile is super difficult in the first, in the beginning. I remember when I first started running, when I was, what, in, I don't know, a couple of years ago, maybe five years ago, when I first started running, when I was super fat and I kind of lost loads of weight in the beginning. Um, it was really difficult to run, obviously because of the weight, you kind of excess weight, just extra difficult to run on pavements. But in general, it's just harder to run because you haven't got the um, the cardiovascular endurance to kind of keep a steady pace as you're running, right? What happens, ends up running when you're, especially when you start the first time, you go out quite quick. You think this is not that difficult and then you quickly realize, number one, you haven't gone that far. And number two, that you're slowing down. Um, by a considerable amount of speed, right? You're just going, you're just going slower and slower and slower and slower the further you go, and it just starts to become painful. And then your weight starts to catch up with you because your weight is then start pulling, putting pressure on your joints, and you just can't move, and your lungs start feeling like you're about to bleed, and it's just a horrible feeling. So you have to kind of get over that barrier, which is why people probably don't like running in the first place because it takes a long time to get comfortable running, right? Um, in the gym, think about it, right? Um, training in the gym, um, whether you're doing free weights, whether you're on a machine or whatever it may be, it's quite easy to kind of get over that kind of hump because you just keep going and little by little incremental steps, you start to improve the amount of reps you can do or the dumbbell curl or amounts of bench press you can do and incremental movements. But running takes a lot longer time to adapt um, your body to it, to the to the strains of it. And it just takes time. You just have to keep going. 
but it's painful. You wake, you're you're going to wake up one morning and your legs are going to feel super sore like they did for me this morning. But then a few a, a few minutes later, like now my toes are kind of already okay and I can probably go for a run again, which I'm not going to do today, but I'm going to do that tomorrow. I'm kind of switching up my workout plan. I'm going to do uh, three days of running and two days off uh, during the five days a week and then see how that goes. And then, then I, if I feel fresh on the Saturday, Sunday, I'm going to continue a long run then again. So you don't necessarily um do that, right? So it's kind of hard to get adjusted to it. But once you get adjusted to it, there's no better feeling because you automatically start feeling how um, you just start, you feel like you could just go for ages. Like now I, I, I can turn, I can kind of speed up when I want to, slow down when I want to. I can maintain the pace. Do you know what I mean? You start to get a bit comfortable in, in you know, knowing how to pace yourself when you're running in general. But, you know, as I mentioned before, it's quite hard to do it in the dark, especially at night. I'm liking doing it at night time. Because I just find sometimes in the morning, especially when I was running. Now I go to gym in the morning, which is a bit easier. I just find in the morning, it's hard to kind of get myself started. That first mile, I might as well be a write-off, right? It just takes ages to kind of get started because I'm literally coming out of bed. Um, it takes a long time to wake up. But I find it easier to kind of get my body started when I go straight to the gym at 6 in the morning. It's just easier to do. I don't know why. Don't ask me why. I'm, I haven't really thought about why it works out better. But I found that that first 10 minutes in the gym is a bit groggy, but I quickly snap out of it. But when I'm running in the morning at 6 a.m., even if I, even at the end of the run, I still don't feel, feel like I'm awake. I still feel like I've been like daydreaming somewhere. Um, and I necessarily, and I don't necessarily think it's uh, that beneficial to be running that early in the morning, especially if I'm not awake, right? It just doesn't seem like you're doing the work. You know, you're not cognitive what you're doing. You're not conscious. You're not um, exerting probably enough effort in the workout. Whereas in the gym, after the first 10 minutes, you're just kind of groggily getting up and putting your weights on the machine and squatting a little bit. You suddenly start to get more in the groove and you start to wake up. And you know what I mean? Like everything starts racing through your body and you just want to do more and more and more. So um, again, it's baby steps. Um, as I mentioned before, I've got a long race season coming up. I've got a couple of 5Ks in Feb. I've got a half marathon coming up in March. Um, another 10K in April. Like loads of little things incrementally. So I just want to build up a good base of cardiovascular um, endurance. And then coming into race season, everything is going to kind of work itself out. And then we should be where we want to be um apart from that oh remember yesterday i mentioned about the whole djing thing right um super happy about that so i'm back djing in dulston now which is kind of you know one of those kind of um little personal achievements kind of ticked off the list right um i mentioned previously in yesterday's episode that you know there was there some or you could you could um you would be right to assume that i might have got like ditched or left out to dry or kicked out the cool circle when that wasn't actually the case i actually decided to take a step away and not kind of hang out in that kind of scene anymore and kind of you know concentrate on bettering myself quote unquote but um i ended up also trying to kind of go through the dj route doing it the kind of you know the tried and true honest old school way right which required me to kind of step away from there the cool scene and just try and dj in bars and clubs around this london and you know and now luckily because of that reputation i built up i've now been invited back to dawson um just to dj not to come and hang out which is fucking cool as well because it's a whole new era of people hanging out in that kind of place and i'm a bit more mature i can approach it a different way and now i'm going to be djing back at um the free compasses uh, yesterday i didn't have a name for the night i didn't want to know what i was going to do i didn't know how, how i was going to approach it but i'm glad to announce that i have got a name now i've done it i saw now what my name is going to be and what i'm going to do um the night i've got here listed up on resonant vibes i'm going to show you on the screen is going to be called bump um not to be confused with extracurricular activities that people get up to when they go to nightclubs i just need to pick a snazzy name and that was what came to mind to be honest um it's called bump it's going to be taking place in um the free compasses in dawson let me get the flyer up here so you guys can see it there we go uh so bump um with me handsome black man as as you can see i'm a black man that's fairly handsome that's quite obvious for the viewing public to see um the free compasses dawson lane um 99 dawson lane um, there we go. There's a flyer um, inspired by the works of Richard Serra, as you can see there. Um, so, yeah, free compasses from 9 to 12.30 a.m. So if you're in the area and you want to have a little boogie, come down on the f on Friday, the 1st of February. And the other day is the 8th of February, um, which is the following Saturday. Um, so check that out there. There is the listing on Resident Advisor and the nice little flyer that I made, which I'm very proud of, you know, doing that in a couple of minutes. Um, which is quite cool. I'm getting better and better at designing these little square flyers on social. Um, so yeah, I'm happy about that. Really over the moon. Can't wait to get started. Um, I'm already preparing a playlist of what I want to do and how I want to approach things. Um, kind of want to go into a, with a fresh mindset. Uh, they have CDJs there too, so I'm going to prepare a playlist to put on my USB stick. I need to buy a new USB stick because the one I've been using at the moment 
I haven't got them here to hand. These fucking things, right? I've been using these USB sticks. It's annoying because I got I bought these USB sticks. I bought another USB stick called um these T Toshiba ones, I think. A black one that I bought on US on Amazon that was really good. Um and it kind of uh you know, same sort of capacity, I think sixty four gigabyte, but it transferred um the songs or it synced up my playlist from record box really quickly. And then I bought these other USB sticks, um these Philips ones from Amazon too, just as backups. And I tried to download the playlist on there for the night I played at Heathcote and Star the other day. And it took so long, it didn't download in time, so I had to take my controller with me. And I don't know why it is, right? Because they're both USB-C. They're both 2.0, whatever. They're both like the same specs that you see in this one. But this just takes considerably longer to transfer any kind of music um, from record box onto my USB. It's not because I have, I'm downloading it directly from my USB, from the stick. I'm downloading it from my computer, from my hard drive, of my you know iTunes songs and stuff. It just takes fucking ages to do. I don't know why they're different but um i guess i'm gonna have to get this toshiba one that i've got that i had previously that i lost i've lost two of them now two black ones fucking amazing um usb sticks really really quick so i'm gonna have to get those and then kind of get started um doing a playlist and then exporting that onto the usb stick and have that ready for the dj set i'm going to be playing it i like to sometimes you know when the place i'm playing at has cdjs it's nice to kind of finally you know get usb sticks and bring them with you and play um um, especially if you're going, you know, if you have any expressions of playing in bigger clubs, most of that they're going to only have CDJs. And it's good to kind of get used to that whole system. Um, of course, we are mixing on a big mixer or whatever it may be. All those kind of things, it's good to kind of know, especially because, you know, when you mix on a, on a two-channel controller, it's not really the same thing as mixing on a big CDJs and a, um, a main kind of, uh, a kind of run-of-the-mill DJM Pioneer mixer, especially because the channels are much longer. That's one thing you realize straight away, right? When you're mixing at home, doing mixes, on the controller, the channels are so small, right? It like to, and you realize how high, how how long the channels are on a big mixer when you're mixing in something another tune. You're like, oh shit, I forgot I to keep going up, 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 up to kind of get the song in. But yeah, that should be fun. So happening on the first of Feb. Can't wait to get started. Anyway, enough about that. On to today's subjects. Number one thing I wanted to talk about something I've kind of kept to myself and kind of didn't want to, you know, say in public because again, I'm not I'm not sure how people kind of take information like this or. And maybe it's, it's done kind of in bad taste, but you know, I've got good intentions with these kind of things. And sometimes it's good to kind of speak up and say your truth because the hope is that when you speak up and say your truth, other people can also be able to know, oh, wow, I'm not alone. And uh, I'm going through a similar situation. I can also, so, um, what do you call it, sympathize with you and I can put out my story and collectively we can bring these things to light and the people responsible for it can be held accountable, right? So the reason why I bring this up is because I've been watching, um, I've been gripped with the Fire Festival documentary that's been, you know, shown on Netflix. I'm sure everyone's kind of seen it by now. There's two documentaries, one on Hulu and one on Netflix. Supposedly the Hulu one um, is a bit more, um, has a bit more of a comedic slant to it. And the Netflix one's a little bit more investigatory, right? Uh, and if you're familiar with Fire Festival, that was the festival that happened, it was meant to happen last year or the year before that. Was it the year before that or last year? I'm thinking. Anyway, a couple of years ago. And the whole reason why it was in people's zeitgeist is because they made this amazing, slick, influencer-based um, video which featured, like, all the big models in the world, you know, Iman, Gigi Hadid, all these people, right? And they were kind of, you know, frolicking around in the beach in the sun in this wonderful island in Bahamas, which is formerly known as um, Pablo Escobar's Island. And um, they uh, were under the premise that this was going to be, like, a Coachella based in the Bahamas, right? A really exclusive Coachella where all these really cool people be hanging out and you get a chance to kind of see these cool people in, a mess, in an amazing venue, you know, in, in the middle of the Bahamas. So on, on paper, it looked amazing. And obviously during that time, that was when FOMO was fucking prevalent on social media. People were kind of, you know, really um, at odds with how social media was dictating how they saw things and how things on social media were presented in one way and real life or the other. And then, you know, as it transpired, um, we got to see that, you know, the whole thing kind of unraveled really quickly and um, the festival didn't go through. Um, they, they completely scammed people. People turned up and they found out the tents that they kind of bought that were sold as one thing were actually um, hurricane relief tents that were kind of co-opted and used in one way. And the food wasn't done the right. Like everything was just a complete nightmare. Um, they didn't have correct sewage lines. They didn't have electricity. Like loads of things that were, you know, the basic run the mill things they kind of overlooked just so they could sell this amazing idea on social. And of course, you know, the business owner himself um, or the entrepreneur behind it, uh, Billy McFarlane, was also a bit of a huckster because he went around, you know, to investors and sold them this dream of this thing he had. And he was able to raise money um, by lying to one investor and then going back and forging the paper to another one and then having to compete for the thing. And just, you know, oh, it kind of encapsulated everything that 
it captured everything that people complain about when it comes to startups. If you listen to someone called uh, Jason Kalkanis, who I've been following a long time, who's kind of one of the main, like, kind of really, a really influential and outspoken angel investor in Silicon Valley, he's someone that kind of be speaking about it a lot. If you read a book called Chaos Monkeys, it speaks about that kind of, you know, overall chaos that, you know, ensues in most startup environments and how they're all kind of riding by the seat of their pants. Um, most of them fail, even though most of them think they're going to succeed. And along the line, they kind of, you know, loads of, um, unintended victims are kind of left, you know, disheveled, destroyed, reputation done, out of jobs, um, whatever it may be, right? And just to kind of um, wax or exercise somebody's ego. It's all in all a really painful experience for everyone going through it. But this documentary, the Fire Festival documentary, hit home for me even more so because I've gone through the same situation myself two times um, working in startups. Um, the one occasion I went through this um, situation was working for a former startup um, called Mastered, uh, an online learning platform that was kind of well known for um, selling these online fashion courses for people that were in the fashion industry and wanted to break through. The whole premise was quite cool. They wanted to build a platform that allowed people that lived outside of the kind of hotbed um, cities to um, access this information, have access to the mentors or the industry leaders and gain the knowledge they need in order to kind of move into industry, having to move cities and all that sort of stuff, right? So the idea was we're going to, it's still going to be a high, quite a high, you know, rate of a cost, of, of, of a course, sorry. It's not going to be cheap. It's not going to be like 200 quid. It's going to be still be in the thousands, but the, the whole point of it is that it's going, to, it's going to maybe, it's going to maybe be a good add-on to university education, or it's going to be a good reason for you not to move to a new city and gain work experience. You could just do that on, on the online have that work experience and kind of use the portfolio you gained on the course to kind of you know aid in a bit your career going forward and um one of the main courses that was really popular for was um the virgil abloh streetwear course which i worked on which i was kind of um one of the main parts uh, one of the main people behind kind of constructing that curriculum right we had a streetwear course led by virgil abloh which was during the beginning stages where virgil was starting to do his off-white stuff and it was quite interesting now looking back at it because you know we, we find it very difficult to get a lot of mentors to sign up to be part of virgil abloh's course or be part of his the course that he's leading because a lot of people thought that they were uh, above him and that he was beneath them and that he was all hype and fluff and the same people that were saying these kind of things are now the same people who are kind of you know at the front row at virgil's louis vuitton show you know sucking his dick which is you know incredible to see in general but i know it kind of isn't surprising considering um the lack of backbone a lot of people have in that industry and just you know the you know the two-faced nature of it in general but you know we had the, we had a we had a term i would say indifferent experience with virgil um it's not something kind of really worth getting into for the most part but i never really had that much contact with him maybe a couple of times for meetings and stuff but mostly my time was spent kind of of creating this course um, alongside a, a couple of other colleagues and making sure it was the best course possible for kids that had streetwear brands because of course I'm really invested in that that's kind of where I come from I was kind of a moderator back on the happy forums I used to I was part of the first couple of people that used to um, contribute to the hype beast blog back in the day um i know I'm, I'm fully involved in this scene this is kind of something that was really really important to me so i kind of did that but of course as per usual because i can see there was a bit of a dull ad i, I went into self-destruction mode or what's it called um self-destruction um whatever it's called self-sabotage mode and kind of fucked it up for myself and it kind of didn't end the way i wanted it to end right so you know we kind of parted ways i kind of went my way they kind of went their way and they continued doing their thing but even though it kind of didn't end well for me personally when that was there one thing that kind of didn't really sit right with me was this thing that um, happened in quite a few other startups was uh pay right and this is something that a lot of people don't really speak about loud but i want to speak about it because i think it's really important to kind of get it out there when i started that job i think i had come from maybe i think i've had maybe only a couple of proper office jobs in that regard right most of my time was spent working in retail on on, on the shop floor so I didn't, I didn't necessarily have this the experience needed um to work in an office job on that kind of role in social media and marketing and that sort of stuff right but i knew i had the skills because you know i was doing my own thing outside of work where i was promoting my nights wherever it was um helping people promote like gallery events or whatever it may be or store launches i knew how to navigate that world right because i sat on that thing all the time i know a lot of people might have you know might think that's a bit arrogant but i know there's a lot of young people out there that will agree with me right you kind of think that you can do a job because you just you sit on the internet yourself you do it yourself you make little fly make little memes what's so hard about it and really and truly once you get into once you get the job you realize it isn't that hard but what you start to realize working for these startups is that if i didn't have that much experience and i came into this role um with like you know good attention a big ego and the one thing that kind of really um started ringing alarm bells for me in my head naturally just because i'm quite self-critical of myself was the pay 
and the pay was quite high considering where I'd come from, right? I didn't think I necessarily deserved that pay, but I just thought it was kind of, you know, what you'd get when you worked in the office, right? Fuck it, right? Because I'd be used to so long working in retail environment where the most I'd earn is probably 18,000 a year, if that. And now you're coming into an office job where you have the opportunity to earn like 32,000 a year starting, right? And it's like, Jesus Christ, right? So you don't really know why that's happening, but you know, you just take it in general. And then once you take it and you realize the job that you're doing day in, day out, I started to feel a bit guilty. I started to feel like I didn't, I was kind of, you know, I don't know. I just started to feel guilty to the money I was making because it didn't make no sense because I was essentially, for, especially for the first six months of that job, I was essentially sitting on social media, replying to people and, you know, alleviating their fears or, you know, looking up their payment details or whatever, just general customer service, community management type of role. And then um, as the kind of comp uh, my time, you know, as a, as it kind of transpired and time went on, I obviously started to get more involved in the company. I started to get a little bit more interested in what was going on. And suddenly the streetwear course popped up and I took more of an active role in getting involved in there. And then, then I kind of felt like I was maybe earning the money a little bit more there, right? Because I was kind of flying around. I was going to all the fashion weeks. I went to Virgil's first off-white show in Paris. Um, I was attending all the trade shows. I was meeting all my heroes in streetwear who were behind the scenes who I always looked up to. Um... And I was kind of doing the thing that I kind of thought I wanted to do, right? But again, I kind of felt like a bit of a fraud. I kind of felt like I was earning money that I probably shouldn't have. And mostly it was due to the fact that I was working this role that I felt at the time was grossly overpaid, right, for what I was doing. I didn't really think it made any sense. Um, and then, of course, you know, my own ambitions for wanting to do my own thing, I kind of felt like I was a bit trapped and I was getting lulled into the benefits of having an office job, which meant you had a company card, you could travel all the time and all that sort of stuff, right? It was kind of throwing me, of course, the stuff I wanted to do myself outside of work. But then the other thing to do with pay was that there was a lot of times when we got paid, we got paid late, right? We got paid, you know, sometimes you imagine you get paid on the 26th. We might get paid at 1 p.m. We might get paid at 3 p.m. Sometimes it might be the 27th. Sometimes it might be the 28th. It was always late, some way or the other, right? Always kind of around late. And that was something that a lot of people told me was normal with startups, but I just didn't think that made any sense. I think anywhere that you work, um, the, regardless of the situation, regardless of how flexible or flat the hierarchy is, I think one thing that can never be um, taken for granted, one thing that can never be kind of like abused is pay and salary. I think um, most people um, know that wherever you, you know, for, in most people's cases, right, where you're working isn't your dream job. You're working in that place more to kind of fulfill your needs outside of work, which, you know, making sure you're clothed, making sure your roof over your head, make sure you have food in your belly, right? That's what you're primarily doing it for. And companies know this too, so they're willing to um, pay you in exchange for the time that you're giving them, right? But in some way, I don't know why, when it happened, maybe because of the whole Facebook and Instagram thing, um, or maybe Google and what Simon Larky, something, somewhere along the way with startups, it, it kind of got around this thought arise in startup culture where you kind of wanted your employees to be mini entrepreneurs uh, and take a vested interest in the business that they you, you've created or the, or the the startup that you have um, to kind of stay long hours to you know forego social events in order to kind of make sure the company gets where it needs to go to and it kind of and the general idea of why people get jobs was lost and somehow founders then wanted people to kind of, you know, be mini versions of themselves, come into jobs and be more passionate about it than they are. It's really, which is fucking bizarre, right? Or as passionate as them. So because of that, liberties were taken with the money because, you know, the kind of idea was that, oh, you're doing really important work. You have more responsibility. You take ownership. You're going to drive the company forward, blah, 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 blah. Like all this sort of key buzzword stuff. But the main kind of, um, uh, needs of an employee won't be met, right? And sometimes, you know, there were way too many cooks in the kitchen, right? Like with a flat hierarchy, it means that everyone's got a voice, which means nothing gets done. Um, number two, um, the pay was always late. So that means that like, some security that you wanted, like, you know, the kind of idea that you don't want to worry about the money, just going and you do your job was always in the back of your head because you weren't really sure whether or not you should spend money that week before. Should you save money? Will you pay rent a day late? Should you have to email that your landlord again? These things were in the back of your head. Um, the HR was always a bit flaky because usually the HR manager was the office manager or the office manager was a HR manager. It wasn't a dedicated role. They, really, they didn't really take a vested interest in the fact of how you were developing. It was just kind of, you know, these um, these kind of um, run-of-the-mill meetings that didn't really do anything and nothing really was said really in an open voice. It was just a really strange environment overall. And all of that was kind of liberties taken because on the, on the front end, they're telling you, look, you've got ownership. You can take control of this role. You can do what the fuck you want. But in the end, you know, the, natural, the normal means of a job aren't being met. So that kind of all threw me off. And then along the way, you know, along the way, another thing that kind of really raised alarm bells when I was working there was that 
um, investments or VC funding or, you know, whatever, or raising money was, was celebrated as if we kind of secured, I don't know, a big sponsorship were celebrated as if we um, broke our sales targets, were celebrated as if we sold out a call six months in the head, when we didn't, right? So they'd always celebrate investment and, and funding with champagne and shit or cakes or whatever it may be or gathering everyone up to stand up and clap and ship in some weird kind of culty way. And I never really got that because that wasn't, a f that wasn't to me, again, with limited experience, I've not run my own business, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, so take everything I'm saying with a pinch of salt. But it didn't seem like to me that that was a way to that was what a business, a successful business should be doing, right? Um, you shouldn't be um, existing solely off the, be off the back of VC funding. That is one of the ways you kind of raise capital in order to kind of, you know, uh, in order to kind of grow a team or maybe to kind of expand your services. But for day-to-day -day running of a company, you shouldn't be um, counting, you shouldn't be hoping that you get VC funding in order to pay your staff. That shouldn't be what's happening. But of course that was happening because, you know, we were all grossly overpaid in our roles. I think no one can kind of complain about that. I think maybe a few handful of people can say, oh no, I got what I deserved or maybe I should have got more. Um, the talent was grossly overpaid, right? Like, I, I don't even want to speculate what some of the mentors got on the courses that I was working on, but I know for sure it was way, way above what anyone else would pay them. And in general, the product we, we delivered was probably a bit subpar considering that no one was a real expert in their field, apart from maybe a couple of people that might have worked in the hair and makeup department of the course who kind of came from really, really good backgrounds. But for the most part, everyone was kind of fobbing it, right? It was kind of a bit chancery. It was kind of just, you know, going with the flow. And again, it reminded me a lot of the Fire documentary with the kid that's uh, meant to be doing the events booking who worked in Fire Media and was kind of drafted to do the events. And he kind of said, you know, out front, look, this is not something I've ever done. I've never been booking talent. This is not a job that I should be doing. But I kind of just took it on board. And that's something that I did too, right? In terms of booking the talent for the courses or booking spaces or chasing up the sponsorship. It's something that I obviously have thought I could do. It's something that I thought, you know, given the opportunity I know I can do, I know I can smash it. I've always have a, um, I always have an inflated sense of self, right? I've, I've, I've kind of always had a um, delusions of grandeur when it came to my own ability. But when it comes down to giving someone the job to do it day to day, I shouldn't really be doing that, right? That requires a manager to step in and say, hey, I know you think you can do this thing, but no, we're going to get somebody else in. We're going to get a consultant. You're going to work with them. That's somebody with more seniority, a bit more experience, and you can kind of work off each other and you can learn that way. But that was something that wasn't done. I was just kind of left in my own devices. And then it transpired, you know, and then, you know, obviously I left on bad terms from my end, but the company then continued to go on. But then over time, I'd hear stories from other people that worked there, friends I'd bump into who were kind of getting let go incrementally bit by bit. People were moving away. And then recently, as of a few months ago, the company completely shut down, right? Master is no longer a thing of operational. They kind of completely shut down. The courses kind of come to an end. They kind of fired literally everybody and kept a, a, a supposed skeleton team to kind of um, deliver the last courses. And then um, what really kind of struck home to me, which reminded me a lot of the Billy McFarland from the Fire Festival, was that the founder of the company um, emailed me, um, of Master emailed me and, and told me, oh, um, that they wanted to do like a, a meetup again with all the old employees and come in, like, it's good to see you. He mentioned a few people that also left on bad terms or also let go off of bad terms, whatever, in the email to kind of persuade me to come. It's a good way to end it. And I remember reading the email thinking, you know, Take away my own situation. Take away what happened to me and how I probably and how I fucked up in my own case, right? But let's just look at it like optics wise, right? This this company has ceased to exist, right? Fair enough. I think the founder did a good job of giving everyone notice, right? He told everyone ahead of time, you know, this thing is over, um, so people could kind of make their own adjustments and do what they need to do. But people are out of jobs, right? Like by and large, everyone's kind of out on their ass, out of a job, um, and now you're asking the same people that are out of a job to come to a bar and celebrate what it's not like the end of the it's not like the end of the it's not like they ended the the company or they ended the program because it came to its natural end they ended it because they couldn't con they couldn't financially continue um to run this company right supposed to be the founder had to remortgage the, his house site twice or some shit right in order to kind of make sure people were getting paid which again you know it's admirable in one sense because you know he's he is looking after his employees in that respect but that isn't how you should be running a business right you shouldn't have to get to that kind of level but it did and then now you ask people to come and celebrate um, the end of this chapter um, with drinks in a bar. And I just thought that was such in bad taste. It didn't, it really rubbed me up the wrong way. Of course, I ignored the email and just carried on doing what I was doing. But of course, life has a funny way of kind of slapping you back in the face again. Now I'm in a situation where um, this company that I've recently left, uh, People.io, has completely fucked over everybody. And now, you know, we all got let go in December. I joined the company in November or the, the beginning of October, the end of October, sorry, 30th, the 30th, 31st of October. I worked there precisely maybe a month. 
I went on holiday uh, for the couple of days at the end of the at the end of uh, at the end of November um, to Manchester. Um, chilled out there with a the brunette, had a good time. And then in the moment I was there, I was meant to get paid the weekend I was there in Manchester. My money didn't come through. So imagine, you know, going to a holiday to Manchester, having a good time, planning all these things. You're going to go have the steak dinner. You're going to go to a cinema. You're going to go do a serious show and you don't get paid. So all of a sudden your plans are all kind of scuppered, right? Which is fucked anyway. Luckily I had some savings, but still it's in the back of your head the whole trip. You can't really enjoy yourself. Then the week. So we don't get paid the day we're meant to get paid. Um, the founder completely ignores us. Nicholas Oliver, who's the founder there, complete scum, a complete scumbag, a complete fraudster in that regard. He's in the same space as the Billy McFarlane guy. Um, Nick, Nick Oliver, the founder of People.io. He doesn't email us, doesn't let us know what's happening. And then they get they get called into a meeting. I'm talking to some colleagues that are working in there whilst I'm away on the Monday. And they get told in no uncertain terms that the company is unable to meet salary of November, duh. And they're going to have to let everyone go. Right, because they can't meet salary, everyone's gonna have to leave, um, and they're gonna put the company on hold. Right, that's what the key phrase that he mentioned. Whilst they try and secure funding in order to kind of get us paid, and that's November. Christmas is coming up, right? So we're all panicking, thinking, "Oh my God, we don't have money for Christmas." But in back of my head, I'm thinking, "No way, he's not gonna fuck us over that deep, right? He's not gonna, he's not gonna do that. He's gonna obviously pay us for Christmas. So we have money for Christmas at least." Obviously, the weeks transpire, and of course, we keep getting random emails, updates where he's saying that he needs to secure investment in order to make sure we get paid. And he kind of throws out this like veiled threat that if anyone speaks up or says anything in public, it's going to affect the investment and we won't be able to get paid. But another thing that he does, which is really a scumbag thing from Nicholas Oliver, is that he he does he refuses to declare insolvency with the company because what happens if you declare insolvency as a startup, which the other company I worked for did, what happens is that the employees can immediately go to the employment tribunal and claim um um the and claim uh, the salary that they were not paid by the company and then the employment tribunal will obviously you know um, take it back from the company on, on their end but it obviously it's not it's still a longer process still a long process it's not going to take a, not a short while but it's still a, a good like w gesture in order to kind of make sure all your employees get paid but Nicholas Oliver refused to do that because under his false illusion under his delusion same in, in the Billy McFarlane way right it's completely delusional he thinks he can still rescue it when if you think about it and you take us out of the situation, imagine we haven't been paid for November, no one got paid in December and all that stuff, right? Two months without it getting paid or maybe three months if you include October when I did get, or when it should have got noticed and we didn't get noticed. Take us out of the situation. If if you couldn't, and it wasn't, we're a small team at people that I owe, only like six or seven of us, right? Full-time staff. If you couldn't pay us that salary for that month, which is, again, it's not, it's 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 a lot of money, but it's not like in the millions, Right. Imagine the amount of other people that he's fucked over along the way who haven't been paid either. There's loads of other victims that have been affected by this guy's inability to run a business, his inability to properly fund the company, his inability just to kind of pay the company, pay the people that work for him, to let them know what's going on, no updates, no information on what's happening. Um, during this whole process, we've kind of gone, I've kind of personally gone back and forth with him over email, trying to see when he's getting any answers. He keeps fluffing and saying loads of words without saying anything. Again, going back to the Billy McFarlane thing where he kind of, you know, and you see a lot sometimes with YouTubers too. A lot of YouTubers who kind of get in trouble with, you know, the sponsors they take on or the fact that they sell merch that's grossly overpriced and all that sort of stuff. They end up doing these long apology videos that don't say anything, right? They end up going on a rant for 30 minutes and they haven't really said anything considerable and they haven't really accepted any sort of responsibility. And Nick was the same sort of way. He kind of always kept pushing away the responsibility and making it seem as if like he wasn't the one that's in charge when obviously he's in charge and obviously it's his fault. And he obviously didn't give us any update. He didn't let us know anything. And instead, he kept giving us all these veiled threats that if we spoke up in public like I'm doing now, that we weren't going to get our money. But, you know, I've kind of had enough after watching the... The, the fire festival documentary i've had enough and i've kind of you know the straw hat brokers come back seen you know a living manifestation of what he was in public too right and this guy is in prison now because of what he's done swinging the money out and nick is the same sort of way the slimy slimy guy right so completely slimy guy and now we got to a point now in january where we still haven't been paid um nothing's been resolved in that regard um luckily i've been able to move on um from that company but it still leaves a sour taste in the mouth right i were left another previous company to kind of go there um again i kind of have to accept some personal responsibility in that regard um i left i might have left my previous company hastily because i was just fed up with the job i kind of felt like it was killing me softly um i kind of felt like i was driving a screwdriver inside of my head um that also have, might have to be due in part because of my own impatience because i generally don't want to work for somebody i want to do my own thing i want to um do something like this um full time i want to maybe dj full time whatever it is right i want to do something that doesn't involve having to have a boss um, full time for myself, so efficiently because I think I have all the ability in order to do it. I see how people are doing it who are 
way less um, well put together than I am or, you know, I'm probably a little bit more put together than they are or whatever, we're on the same level. It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter how good I think I am, but I want to do it too, right? Um, and I think I have the skills to do it. So maybe that kind of played into my haste of moving so quickly. But then when I moved, another part that as well that I want to kind of throw out there and let people know just so you're kind of aware of this, don't always move for money sometimes because startups have this thing where they are quite lowering in the sense that you get control you uh, you get ownership you can kind of see the works of your hand you can kind of implement a project and kind of do things really quickly and you can kind of see it and put it in the cv and you can feel responsible for you did that thing and then they obviously also dangled the fact that the carrot of the head of salary usually startups pay a lot more than industry not a lot more but i'd say entry level you kind of start really high Maybe the, the and the and the process to get the job is a fairly quicker compared to if you want to work for BT or, or B Sky B, right? You have to go through loads of loads of more stages. Maybe you have to go through a recruitment um, team or whatever it may be. But with uh, H with startups, usually the HR person is one or two people. You kind of go through a couple of interviews with them over the phone, and then quickly you meet people face to face, and you kind of get offered a job really off the back of that. Maybe in a space of two weeks, you can secure a job from the beginning to the end. And of course, the salary dangled in front of you, entry level, kind of would lure you in. But I want to say openly, like you know, most people know this, but not all good, not all money is good money, and sometimes chasing the salary isn't the best idea. If you have a job where you're getting paid a modest wage, the job isn't that taxing on you mentally, and you can kind of turn up and go home. Maybe it's a good idea, even if you have uh, aspirations to start your own business, it's a good idea maybe to stay there, save up the money and then decide to go. And then when you decide to go, go and never come back to employment again, rather than what I did, which was, you know, let me go somewhere else and get a bump in salary so I can save more. Right. Which would then help me in my future businesses. But then what happened is I went to go get that bump in salary. Then the job ended up imploding after a month and a half or two months. And you know what I mean? And now I'm kind of back where I started even before. Um, I don't mind it personally before because again I got humility and I accept my own kind of indefic my own kind of I can respect that maybe it was partly it was like eighty percent my fault in that respect right but I'm also kind of aware that some people are not like that not wired that way and it can kind of be a big dent to the ego and shit that you kind of suddenly back where you started again but I don't mind that I'm okay with it I think I, again I've have, I've I have aspirations way bigger and way larger than where I'm working at so I can kind of accept. Um, that I'm kind of earning my keep doing that job, right? And kind of proving my worth. And like I said before, how you do one thing is how you do everything. So I'm not taking that for granted. But I think in general, it needs to be said that don't always chase the salary. Don't always chase the money. And don't always get, and don't be duped by charismatic char charismatic leaders, uh, leaders that get you, uh, bosses that seem that they can be your friend and all that sort of stuff, because there's warning signs there. Because if they have to compensate, um, they, if, if they have to kind of overly compensate friendship and, um, warm and being warm and charismatic with you and the job that probably means the actual job itself the actual conditions of what you need to do to kind of do a good job aren't going to be great usually that is usually my kind of experience i've had the, the nicer the manager was the shittier usually in, in comparison the job was um and in the most indifferent manager was like you know just general in general the environment was the better the job was because then you were able to kind of ex extract your own value from it you're able to kind of claim your own responsibility are you kind of given the platform to kind of prove yourself amongst your peers as opposed to like you know gaining friends and gaining um i don't know points socially in a group of people that you work with because you drink the most or because you get drugs and shit that isn't probably the good way to go about things but i see that a lot in startups so that's something i kind of want to just say openly um Nicholas Oliver from People.io is a fraudster and a shuckster. He hasn't paid anyone, any of his employees from People.io from October, November to December. We're all still waiting now for our pay. We haven't received no updates. We just got our P45 the other day, um, which has kind of been handy, of course, because I've been getting double tax and shit. But um, yeah, Nicholas Oliver is a fraud and a, fr and a shuckster and he's a lot like Billy McFarland. Um, that's basically what I want to say out loud so everyone knows um, after watching the Fire Festival documentary. Whew, it's good to get that off your chest, you know, be real for once um, and get that out there. Because, again, these are things I've only kind of, you know, again, I'm not the biggest social group person out there. So I don't necessarily tell this to everyone. Um, and, again, it's not everyone's business, I guess, in that regard. But, you know, it's good to kind of get these things out there because, unfortunately, these people, um, these fraudsters like Nicholas Oliver and, and Billy McFarlane, they own, the only way you can really hurt them is by publicly damage their reputation. No amount of emails, no amount of big caps locks, no amount of voicemails, no amount of texts left on their phone is ever going to really get them to do anything or to answer for the wrongs that they've done to you. They're only going to respond once their reputation in public has been ruined because that's the only thing they live for, right? Um, Billy McFarlane, you know, wanted to look the part on social media. He went to look the 
part on social, but his actual business didn't work from that fucking credit card thing to everything else he did prior. It was all kind of, they looked good on paper, but they weren't actually functioning as businesses, which again, I think is going to implode. We're going to see it. Gary Vee's talked about it a few times. Um, we're going to see this change happening. Like all these startups that happened, that like, popped up, you know, the Airbnb of this, the Uber of that, that were just fucking absolute bullshit, right? They were able to secure funding somewhere or the other. They had 17 full-time staff when they only were in operation for like three months. They were going to go crashing down because they're not running a business that anyone wants. They're not, you know, I mean, they're not generating any money. They're not doing anything. They're just surviving off of VC funding, which is again, bullshit. But hey, what do I know? Anyway, um, let's move on, move on, move on. Um, moving on deep, moving on on. Drake announces Euro Tour. Drake announces Euro Tour. Shit. So fucking hyped, man. Um, Drake has announced his tour for Europe on Twitter. I think he might announce it on Instagram too, but I don't use that uh, for the most part. It sounds fucking awesome, man. Fucking awesome. So it's called the Assassination Vaccination Tour. He's going on tour with um, his new best buddy now, Tory Lanez, which is awesome to see. And yeah, look at that. Look at the date. So they're going to England, uh, England, Ireland, Holland, France, and and Belgium, it looks like, or Germany, right? And what's fucking crazy, right, looking at the flyer, what's absolutely insane is that he's doing six London dates. Six London dates. Six. Six times. So that means he's going to sell out the O2 six times in a row, which is fucking insane. I don't know how, what's the capacity of the O2? Is it at 60,000, right? The capacity of the O2? Is it 60,000, I think so? Might be 60,000. Let's double check that. Um, O2, oh. Mm, O2 capacity. 20,000. He's going to sell out a 20,000 arena six times in a row. That is fucking insane. Like, and you know he's going to do it too. There's no way he's not going to do it. Um, I'm super looking forward to the tour. I cannot wait. I missed all the other tours. Well, I missed, yeah, a couple of the others that he did um, that he, when he came to London. This is one that I'm not going to miss. I'm really bummed out that I didn't, I didn't see Drake and Future when they came here. Um, of course, tickets are going to sell out, but I don't mind buying on resale. Definitely going to buy a couple for me and the Brunette to go to because I'm sure she'll enjoy it. Um, I'm probably going to do seated seats this time. I usually am always kind of in the um, on the ground floor. Um but I noticed when we went to the future that sometimes you do want a bit of a rest just to chill out and sit down sometimes. I kind of never got the whole standing. I never kind of got the whole seated area thing. I always thought seat, standing area was better because you could just move around and be a bit more free. But sometimes it does get a little bit, you know, you can get, it does get a little bit fatigued. You can get a little bit fatigued standing up and especially during the opening acts and stuff. It's a good idea maybe to kind of get a good seat seat in. And it's a bit annoying when you're standing up because there's the fucking other chairs in front of you are directly in front of your knees, especially with me with my big fat legs. They were smacking across my shins. But uh, by and large, you can kind of enjoy the show a little bit better by sitting down, having a little chill, having a drink with you, you know, just chilling out, hanging out. So that should be fun. Uh, futures coming to fucking London. And what dates are those? Um, get that back on the screen to show you here what dates again. For those of you that are interested, so you got yeah, so what? Uh, he's coming to London from April the first to the ninth, which is insane, man. Fucking insane. He's absolutely going for it, isn't it? Six shows in a row. We just to see who he does, who he has as um opening acts and stuff, right? So he's bringing Tory with Lens with him. I'm assuming he's gonna probably have Skepta and Gigs and those kind of guys. I'm sure w probably anyone else maybe. Um, maybe Miss Banks might come along. Um, maybe a few of the other road rap dudes or a lot. Sorry, a lot of the other um. UK rap guys, um, maybe some of the drill dudes might perform too. That'd be quite cool because six shows again gives opportunity for everyone to play. Because that's why he did really well with the um, with the blah, 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 with the top of Finger Jiggy. Uh, what's that? The latest album, right? Um, every place that he went to, most spot, especially the especially like places like Atlanta and stuff, he brought loads of people out to perform on the stage. Which was quite cool to see them get the look to perform. You know, because Drake is a fucking mega star, right? But he's also has a lot of fans that kind of cover a broad spectrum of hip hop music. So by and large, everyone in the audience will know somebody that's in that's, that's performing as an opening act. So even if it's someone really obscure, somebody will have heard a track from them. So it gives them the opportunity to kind of perform in front of fans and perform in front of people that don't really know who you are. So you kind of get, get the opportunity to kind of gain a new audience on that platform. So that's fucking awesome. And of course, you know, Drake being a, an absolute fanboy of anything that's to do with UK music, I'm sure he's going to absolutely flood that stage with loads of people. Um, that we would know and love to kind of, you know, help him on the show of Raw. And of course, Tory Lanez should be interesting too, because he's always kind of talking about how great of a performer he is. So it'd be good to see how he is live. Um, all the, from all the videos I've seen, it, um, he looks quite incredible um, performing live, actually. Um, but of course, you know, these things are always better to see in person. Uh, it's interesting, a little bit of, uh, what do you call it? 
the little bit of pettiness involved in the um, in the tweet here with the purple devil emoji, the one that Kanye West was so annoyed by. So um, that should be interesting to see if there's any sort of um, bars or any sort of uh, graphics or anything associated with Kanye that are going to be displayed on there because they're going through this little petty back and forth that they're engaged in now in media. Um, so that was something I saw. I was thought that was interesting. What else was on the list there? Da, da, da. Oh, Deck Mental 2019 lineup. So, um, Deck Mental's happening, right? Um, Deck Mantle, Deck Mantle, Deck Mantle, how do you pronounce it? Um, the foremost uh, premier festival in Holland, right? Um, it's been really, it's, it's become one of the mainstays in the kind of electronic um, mu uh, festival festival schedule right for people i've seen a lot of people mentioning it a lot of times um, i've seen a lot of coverage of it of course um they've gained a lot of traction marketing wise through their partnership with um, boiler room uh, boiler room kind of set up shop um i don't know what stage it is that they play at the one with the kind of shelter that everyone kind of stands at um loads of kind of legendary sets have, have been played there over the years like um the motor city drum ensemble god jansen um a few other people that I can't remember for the life of me, but loads of great sets have been played alongside um, Decamental with Boiler Room. So they've been really helped with that kind of partnership of being able to kind of broadcast some of these really amazing DJs playing in this amazing set in Holland. For the most part, everyone's really in good spirits. It's one of the best crowds you'll see in festivals because usually for the most part, it's really difficult to, I've, I've found anyway, whenever I go to a festival and I see an electronic music actor or DJ, it's really difficult to kind of vibe or to kind of get involved or to kind of have fun because you're so used to that music being played in a dark, dingy warehouse basement or nightclub, so it's very difficult to kind of see that person that you kind of imagine if you can, imagine if you saw Ricardo Villalobos play all the time at Fabric when he comes when he comes to London, right? And you suddenly see him playing in this tent somewhere or in an open field somewhere. It doesn't really have the same thing affected it. And of course, because I'm so used to, and I guess as European audiences, we're quite spoiled because I think maybe. Yeah, I think we're so used to seeing bands perform in festivals as a European audience. We go to see indie bands, rock bands, whatever it may be, even hip-hop acts sometimes. We're not really... It, it's hard to kind of switch over to the DJ thing. It just doesn't feel um, natural or normal. But Deck Mantle seems like the only one... To, and again, this is through video, so it's even, it's, even a, it's even a more detached experience, right, for me personally watching it. But through video, it seems like they kind of get it. They kind of know what works and how it works properly, right? And... Um, and I've kind of loved that about Degmental. I've kind of loved that it kind of works. The people there obviously have a good time. And you can tell a lot about a festival through the kind of smiles you see in people's faces that are in the fucking audience, that are having a good time. The amount of fun the DJs look like they're having. The staff working at Boiler Room look like they're having a blast, like being in the sun in the middle of Amsterdam. Like it just looks like complete fun. And I've always kind of thought about going, right? But of course, um, festival, se festival season for me is always a bit of a toss-up because you're having to choose, pick and choose where you want to go because by and large, most festivals are in the same sort of window. You have to kind of make sure you request holiday from work earlier because everyone's kind of usually going in the same time, same sort of time to various other festivals around the country or around Europe, or around the world. So you have to make sure you kind of get in there quickly and you decide and you start saving up because when it when it when I've always noticed, especially in the beginning of the year, you feel like it's it's not gonna you know it's not until ages ago and all of a sudden it's there and then you're suddenly like oh shit I got no money I didn't book a flight I haven't booked an Airbnb and you have to scramble the last couple of months to kind of get everything together and it ends up costing you two times as much as if you would have just planned it out before in the beginning like you no know, now for instance I've seen flights to go to Amsterdam for like sixty quid right for that weekend and um, when Deck Mental's on the thirty first or fourth july i'm um, 31st of july to the 4th of august so if you get that quickly now and you secure the tickets you're kind of already out you're kind of already done right you kind of got your ticket and you got your flight for under 300 quid and then you can kind of slowly but surely start saving up and looking for airbnbs or hostels and stuff along the way as you, as you get closer to the date but those things are out of the way but when you start doing it later and you add in spending money and all that sort of shit it, the, the price can suddenly go up but again it takes a lot of planning and of course, most of these festival people like to go with friends. So you have to kind of coordinate with your group of friends to go with. It's all a bit difficult. But I think Deck Mantle, um, having seen the lineup and seen it, because oh, they did a really, really cool job of announcing the lineup. They kind of did it all on Instagram through one individual post of each lineup going up. You know, kind of a standard trope people that are on social media now where they kind of wipe their social media feed and start again, which I've, I've seen Joe, uh, J. Cole do with the release of the whole Dreamville tape sessions, things that they've been doing. I think they're going to release a tune actually tomorrow based on that. But I just like the simplicity of the kind of, you know, announcing of the lineup. Nothing too and, um, crazy. Just like, you know, all the leaders announced in one day across 24 hours, all on, all on Instagram feed. And here it is. I'll show you. 
So I think in order to kind of make sure I kind of do this and I kind of go, I'm just going to decide to buy the tickets and go myself. And if anyone, does, any of my friends decide they want to come along, they can come along. But there's just too many good DJs here to see that I'm going to, I don't want to kind of let go. And plus, on top of that, we always kind of go to Primavera Festival um, during the summer. And I think this has been the first one where kind of a lot of people have been a bit indifferent about the lineup. I personally don't really like the lineup of Primavera Sound, uh, but I kind of get it that, you know, sometimes is you, you do need a few big hitters um, to kind of really kind of make that trip worthwhile, even though it is worthwhile to me, because I think paying 180 euros um, to go see, you know, loads of bands, loads of acts play across three days in the middle of summer in Barcelona, eating amazing food, drinking amazing, um, <laughs> uh, drinking amazingly, whatever it may be in the sun is well worth it, even if the lineup isn't that great. But I know for some people, sometimes the effort isn't probably worth it doing all that nonsense of booking and taking time off just to go see a few people that you don't even know about. And the part of the fun of going to festival is seeing someone that you know um, in a different setting, right? Um, so I think what I'm going to do, because of the indifference of that, is just book deck mantle, get that out of the way. And if anyone that comes along, they want to come. And then everything else that happens on the side that we want to do, I can do too. Because, you know, that will be my kind of main festival that I'm going to go to. But I've seen tickets, I think, are like 130 euros to 180. And again, it's really heavily based on electronic music. So again, if you're not involved in, if you're not kind of a fan of DJs and stuff, and you haven't been going to club and stuff, maybe it's not the best festival for you. But I think for someone like me that's obsessed with going out, obsessed with nightlife culture, these are perfect for me because these are all DJs that I kind of would love to see. So this is the entire lineup kind of done all in the individual squares. You've got the main one there. Um, of course, Cassie Mosey, someone that a lot of people like. Um, I'm interested to see who I'm mentioning here that I want to really see. Uh, DJ Python, of course. Elena Colombi, somebody that I've kind of known personally through the old school Love Fever days. So I'm really happy for her. I'm not sure if it's her first time playing, but I think she's going to be a perfect fit for uh, Deck Mantle. She's really eclectic kind of um, range of music that she plays. Um, again, she comes from a uh, real good history of playing loads of underground warehouse parties in London where you kind of allowed the opportunity to kind of play what you want for a really captivated audience. Again, I met her through Love Fever, which was kind of one of the big best kind of club nights I went to back in the day in London, which um, was led by Alexander Bradley and Andy Bird. They kind of parted ways and they're kind of doing their own things now, but that was one of the kind of main places I used to kind of go to and kind of party and she was kind of one of the main fixtures there. So I kind of really rate her. So I'm really happy to see she got booked there. So it'd be great to see her play in that regard. Um, Andrew Weaver, of course, a UK legend, somebody that's been pushing and um, just somebody that's been playing in their pocket for such a long time, even when it kind of went hypey and it got weird. He's always somebody that kind of, you know, he's always, I've always said Andrew Weaverall is a DJ's DJ. He's always somebody that rates. Like, you know how um, uh, Bielsa is that leads, right? Crazy fucking manager. But most managers love him because, you know, he's the epitome of what it means to be a football coach, right? He's so analytical. He's really detail-oriented. He's obsessive about um, football. Andrew Weaverall is the same. He's, he's a, a music obsessive, right? He only cares about the music and music is all he cares about. And he's probably one of the best DJs I think out there, especially all around in terms of appealing to a wide range of people. Um, so it'd be great to see him. Um, we're going to see Surgeon of course John Hopkins always somebody who does really well great productions I've got a lot of his tracks that I play out Danny Crivet will be great to see um, Dr. Rubenstein of course somebody that I've been a really big fan of in the last couple of years or so who I saw play back to back with Roy Perez and Mick Sky which is probably one of my favourite sets um, if ever in the year um, she's going to be fucking amazing I'd assume playing in the fucking heat outside in, in at Deck Mental is going to be fucking awesome to see her uh, Cosmic Force will be great to see live um, Le Leroy Burgess too who also I like here quickly mentioned loads of really good names but someone Royce Murphy somebody that I'm a big fan of Bruce is going to be great um, I think he's actually playing this weekend at Mixed Garage I think Bruce is playing this weekend so if you're up for that you should definitely check that out a, a really good um, DJ too um, Ben UFO and Blau One will be amazing Marcel Dietman will be fucking cool <laughs> Like, so many good DJs here playing. Nose Drip will be great to see. Adam X will be great to see. Like, amazing, amazing, amazing lineup. Just all just kind of laced with John Talbot. A lot of people like his productions. Mala will be great to see again. I haven't seen Mala play in ages. Wow. DJ Storm. Just it's gonna it's gonna be an amazing festival to go to in in general. That's the entire line. Mostly drum ensemble is like one of the main fixtures of of um of Deck Mantle. Somebody that kind of you know really kind of encapsulates what Deck Mantle is about. I think sound wise and just the way he enjoys the music and just I really love him. Really really fun DJ. Use Tomo. Oh that's all that. Leaves Tumor will be playing a lot of people. Right, his album. I haven't actually listened to it. Uh, Jeff Mills of course. 
uh, legend. So it's going to be an amazing festival from the 31st to the uh, 4th of July um, in Amsterdam. Something I'm really looking forward to going to. I can't wait. And loads of people that I know, a lot of people I don't know. Again, it's just a great opportunity to kind of meet new people and see um, new things. I'm part of the subreddit as well on, on Reddit of the Deck Manor Festival. Loads of people are going there solo too. So if I don't end up going with anybody, I'll probably have quite a few lot of people to meet out there that probably want to hang out. But, you know, I've been to quite a few festivals on my own. I went to, I think, um, Download Festival the kind of number one sort of like heavy metal festival here in the UK a few times on my own and that was a really good experience you kind of meet a lot of people out at the festivals anyway because festivals are kind of like weird right it's a bit shitty but you get to meet cool people and hang out and go for drinks and shit so that's something i'm looking forward to doing as well so um yeah i can't wait man deck mantis coming up in july um i can't wait to go what else is here is on Le Oh, this is cool. <laughs> so, have you seen, of course, I'm sure people have seen the whole um, Soldier Boy um, promo run that he's been doing, right? Soldier Boy's been on a bit of a promo run, kind of, you know, finally sticking up for himself and trying to reclaim his props and making sure people don't underestimate him, which is kind of, you know, well and good. But what's interesting to me about this whole Tiger, uh, um, still Tiger, I mean, Soldier Boy media rollout is that it seems like to me anyway Max, from what i've seen from the outside a lot of people are complaining about it because they're like oh no one was talking about no one was talking about soldier boy and all of a sudden he starts mentioning these these he starts saying these crazy things and saying tiger tiger all of a sudden everyone's kind of keeping attention to him right he had he had media in his hands um for like a day or two right he was all over the place right he did an amazing breakfast club interview he went on and defended himself on everyday struggle and he kind of just in general was kind of being a a really good egg in terms of getting himself all over the place on social and being viral as he's you know one of his main mo's but i've seen people a lot of com people complaining that oh look he's doing all this stuff and it's sad because nowadays all you all you have to do is say crazy shit and you're gonna get everywhere right um and i have a problem with that because i think sometimes i think i think really hyper creative people or people that who believe they do great work um are always complaining about the people that don't do that who don't do great work in their eyes but are really good at self-promotion and they don't really understand the era we're living in. We're living in an era where, like, you know, distribution is the main aim of the game, like strategy and being able to know when to drop stuff, when to release stuff, where to, what podcast to appear on, what video to put your music against. Like, all these things are really important in order to kind of, um, in order if you really want to gain traction and kind of, um, kind of pierce through uh, the current social consciousness become viral all that sort of stuff if you want to be a big star if you want to be somebody that everyone's talking about if you want to be a celebrity if you want fame there are things that you have to do right and these and i think sometimes these hyper creative people who are also not good at self-promotion um just they live in this fancy land where they think that uh, their work alone is going to get them where they need to get to and unfortunately those years those times are way what they're they're more than gone they're, it's over it's not gonna happen ever again that's the whole reason why they have people at buzzfeed or people like the you know at cnn or fox or wherever these these places are um, these media platforms daily mail some you know credible journalists why they don't have journalists writing the titles of the articles that they write right they have actual people who that's their job to write the most clickbaity title of an article so people can click on them right because you know they know that virality and distribution and organic spread of an article or even paid spread with his advertising and stuff is the most important thing and without that no one wins so I think if you're someone that's really talented and you trust in your ability and you know you're you've got great work and you're just waiting for somebody to get to notice you, you shouldn't be waiting for someone to notice you. You should take the responsibility into your own hands and try and get that work out there. If Soldier Boy has kind of hacked the system and realized that the only way to kind of gain value or gain some attraction is to kind of talk wild, and then you're hoping that with that attention it can kind of generate into kind of album sales and stream numbers and all that sort of stuff. Again, this it's not I think this times are no different to any other times. I think you can do whatever you want. You could probably run down the street naked and become viral, right? And off the back of that, you can put out a song if you don't care about your morality or you don't have any self-dignity or whatever it may be. You can do that sort of stuff. But if your song's shit, no one's going to listen to you ever again, right? So it's kind of like, it's kind of a two-edged sword of reality. It gets you immediate attention, right? But it also doesn't get you, it doesn't earn you any sort of, um, you don't get you don't get given a second chance. You have to immediately hit while the iron's hot or strike while the iron's hot but then if we, when you strike and it's not good enough, people are going to completely dismiss you and no one will ever hear about you again. That's the issue that you have there. So it's kind of a weird game to play. But I think if you're really talented and you're bemoaning why Soldier Boy is this popular, I think you have the responsibility to kind of do that, to kind of copy that 
template of of kind of getting yourself out there of course with you know keeping making sure you're you know you making sure it aligns with who you are and it's something you're comfortable to do but you cannot just rely on your work alone to kind of get you out there you just can't and you can't be and i don't think it's um advantageous or i don't think it's beneficial to sit there and complain that somebody who you don't think is that talent is able to kind of self-promote themselves without a big label right without the machine behind them um just through f- fucking ranting and raving when maybe you should kind of adopt some of those traits maybe not ranting and raving maybe, maybe putting out a statement piece maybe kind of responding to something on social maybe kind of plug into what's trending and kind of using that to kind of co-opt it or maybe placing yourself in certain in magazines or certain publications there are things that you can do to kind of gain that sort of traction too but you have to do them and again, it's something that doesn't really come. I don't think natural to maybe a lot of true creative, right? You kind of feel a bit cringy. You kind of feel a bit self-conscious. You kind of feel a bit embarrassed. But I just think if you trust in your ability and you think your work is good enough, you owe it to yourself to try and get it in front of as many people as possible. And I don't think you can complain or bemoan the person that does that and doesn't have the ability because I think that is a real skill in itself. Um, self-promoting is something that I've struggled with over the years. I'm sure a lot of people struggle with, but it's something that you kind of have to do. And... Um, that being said, this parody video of Soldier Boy really made me laugh. I'm going to quickly play here for you guys um, from this YouTube comedian. Get it up on here. It's by, get the title of the video. It's uh, Soldier Boy the Creator, playing on title the creator's name, by uh, L- Lenar Young. He's on uh, YouTube. I'm subscribed to him. He's quite a cool dude, actually. He does some really good videos in general for like a YouTube comedian is really, really funny because most of these guys aren't funny, but this guy is super, super funny. But I'll play this little Soldier Boy parody. You guys can hear it and you can see it on the screen. You know, Soldier Boy coming over. Soldier Boy coming over. Yeah, Soldier coming over. Oh my God. Hey, what up, What up, man? Y'all need y'all haircut for real. Just looking rough out there, man. Y'all, just, y'all haircuts looking rough. I know, man. I ain't get my junk cut in a while. I know, bro. I got my junk cut too. Hey man, if y'all need a haircut, come to the soda shop. We cut everybody here, man. You know, your barber probably charged you twenty dollars. <laughs> my barber's charge y'all nineteen ninety nine. You got a barber shop? Yeah, man. <laughs> you know I invented the barber shops, right? <laughs> I invented them. Soldier invented everything. <laughs> These barber shops all around the world owe me like six percent each. All of the barber shops in the world. Barber shop, you go to the barber shop, you go to. Owe me like six percent each. Even the movies, you, you see barber shop, <laughs> see barber shop, you see beauty shop, they owe me like 10%. You pay up, man, they owe me like 10% each. Big soldier credit is. I, I'm the first person to come with a barber shop. I made the barber shop. Yeah, you right, you right. Yo, what is this dude talking about, man? He so nice lights you got around your house, man. The electricity flowing all around, beautiful. Oh yeah, man, I got those for my kid. Lights over here. Cost me like a buck fifty. Yeah, a buck fifty out of that kid. Y'all know y'all owe me five percent, right? Like like the whole world owe me five percent. <laughs> Bro, what is you talking about? I'm saying the whole world owe me, man. Everybody with lights and electricity around, around their house. <laughs> owe me. It's so I invented good. this shit. So good. Big Draco invented this shit. I invented this shit. All, all this y'all owe me. I invented this electricity. All right, bro. Man. All right, bro. No, you did not. No, you did not. You did not make electricity. You didn't. You, you didn't make no lights. You did not do that. You did who not do that. Who made it? Who made it? Tell me. Tell me. <laughs> tell me right now who made this. Bro, bro. Benjamin Franklin is the one that got electricity flowing everywhere, and Thomas Edison is the one that made the light bulb. Anyway, it continues a bit longer. Um, you I, said I, who? I, I Benjamin let... Franklin. <laughs> Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison. <laughs> Thomas Edison. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin! Oh, so good. We, they got the- anyway, I'll pause it there. I'll let you guys watch it yourselves. Um, I'll link it into show notes. You can check it out. Um, it's called Soldier Boy, the creator. It's a really, a really funny little parody video of uh, uh, Soldier Boy's press run in the last few weeks. Um, anyway, that's an hour from me. I think that's a good place to end it and put a button on it. Um, again, thank you so much for tuning in to the x News English episode number 147. As always, uh, you know, do the whole like, subscribe shit. That people talk about um, links to all my socials in my main site, actionalzinger.com, which is in the bio. Um, all the DJ listings, all that stuff is going to be found there. Um, and you'll see me again tomorrow for another episode of the Actionals Zinger Show um, coming to, to you very, very soon. Thanks so much for tuning in. Peace.